Um, thank you, um, everyone, for coming along today. Um, and for those who've um, been coming along for all of October, thank you. Um, and for those that are just waiting on the recordings, um, I'm sure you'll hear this um, hear this when we sort of circulate it all at the end of the month. But um, yeah, no, we we hope we hope the content we're helping prepare has been meaningful for everyone. Um, and I guess today, what we're diving into after having spoken about um, a or spoken about um, how to make a claim and how to respond to a claim, now we're dealing with um, if things aren't agreed, um, how to manage it through the process of of adjudication. Um, so I'm presenting today with Mary Ann. Uh, Mary Ann's um, a senior associate in our team. We're still in separate offices. Morning, Mary Ann. And yeah, so we're going to be talking um, around the process of adjudication, both from the person that is making the claim. Um, so using adjudication in in with a view of trying to um, use adjudication as as their dispute resolution method, um, right through to those who need to respond um, to an adjudication claim and it, take it in the context of what we've spoken about previously. Um, so, you know, this is best served with a listen of um, the payment claims and the payment schedule um, um, webinars, um, but also in the context of the other materials that will obviously circulate towards the end of the month. So. Um, we'll dive right in. Um, so as a starting point, there's three um, three main roads that can take us down the path to adjudication. So I'll talk through each of them. Um, so a respond, you know, um, a claim's made, um, the respondent fails um, to um, pay on time, the claimant can look down the path of um, adjudication or seek summary judgment. And we've spoken about those options a, a little bit previously. So in that circumstance, the respondent may have a second chance to serve a payment schedule. Um, the most usual pathway we see, um, particularly in the context of people being familiar with um, the process of adjudication and familiar with the um, security of payment legislation um, is someone serves a claim. Um, the person who has to respond to that claim, the respondent disagrees and serves what, calls a, call, what is called a payment schedule, which was, you know, the hot topic last week. Um, and when we talk about the payment schedule, we still call it that most important document in the whole process. Um, the claimant looks at the payment schedule and goes, look, I don't agree. I think I'm entitled to more than what they've assessed. Um, they then go down that path of adjudication. Um, the next one, um, and then we've got obviously the respondent um, disagrees, serves payment schedule, claimant agrees to the payment schedule, respondent fails to um, um, pay on time, and then you can sort of start that process with the 17-2 notice to go down, um, or you can go down that process towards summary judgment. Um, we're making assumptions that all the documents are valid and served on time in these examples, and we can talk about jurisdictional issues later on. Um, but yeah, we'll jump right in. Thanks, Mike. So um, we will be touching firstly on the adjudication application. So when do you lodge an adjudication application? So this is under section 17 of the Act. There's three scenarios in which you can um, lodge an adjudication application. So the first instance is where they have provided a payment schedule, but the schedule amount is less than the payment claim amount. So there isn't any sort of guidelines on if there's a threshold of how less it is from the payment claim. So um, theoretically, even if it was a dollar less than the payment claim amount, you can adjudicate on that. The second uh, scenario is where they have provided a payment schedule, but they've failed to pay whole or part of the scheduled amount. So um, for example, if the claim amount was um, $100, they've only paid $50, you can still adjudicate on that process due to the fact that it's not fully paid. And the last instance is where they've failed to provide a payment schedule and they've failed to pay um, any part of the payment claim amount. We'll go, we'll touch into this point a little bit um, in the next slide in terms of the section 17.2 notice. So the purpose of the Act is to facilitate quick payment um, for contractors. So failure to comply with these time constraints um, may affect your ability to lodge an adjudication application. So we'll just run through those three scenarios. So if a payment schedule has been served and it's less than the claimed amount, um, you would have to apply, sorry, you have to lodge your application within 10 business days after you receive the payment schedule. In the instance where the payment schedule has been served, but the respondent has failed to pay the schedule amount by the due date of payment, 
you must make your application within 20 business days after the due date of payment. And this is a common one that we do see. So that's when a payment schedule hasn't been issued and the respondent has failed to pay the claimed amount. So this is what's called a section 17.2 notice um, will need to be issued prior to adjudicating. So the purpose of a section 17.2 notice is to give the respondent an opportunity to provide a payment schedule. So they get an additional 15 business days and in that, sorry, additional five business days. And within that five business days, they will have to um, issue a payment schedule. You must issue a section 17.2 notice within 20 business days immediately following the due date for payment. After that five business days has elapsed, you will then have an additional 10 business days in that period to lodge your adjudication application. It's back to you, Mike, on the setbacks. Sorry, Mike, I think you're on mute. Yeah, I was really hoping to avoid uh, Marianne having to say that. I didn't make it that far. Um, so look, we've we've touched on these a little bit around, um, and, and part of the reason we we spent webinars focused entirely on both payment claims and payment schedules um, was to help people minimise the risk of having these common setbacks. So um, the big ones we we still see. Um, I mean, it, it is funny. Like I suppose the security payment legislation is now. You know, 20 you know 22 um this year you know it's been drinking in the us for more than 12 months now um so you know it's it's not a it's it's not young anymore but you, we still see these problems come up all the time um so the first one is you know the contract is not a construction contract or um fits within that category of a contract or other arrangement to which party one party agrees or sorry undertakes to carry out construction work or supply related goods and services for another party so the work simply aren't construction work or related goods and services and i can say as recently as 9am this morning um, i was looking at a contract and having to assess whether the um, um, goods being supplied under that contract fit into the context of what um, what would be a construction contract um, they could be works that are expressly excluded by the act um, those those types of works have been limited um, with the latest round of um, um, changes back in 2019 um, there wasn't a valid payment claim and that's still a big problem um uh, the payment claim not being valid and in particular um it being served on the incorrect um party so someone that isn't a party to a construction contract or where there isn't a construction contract between the parties um and the so the payment claim and where the payment claim isn't isn't properly served or received um and where the other form issue we see is people sending a whole bunch of payment claims um, as opposed to just sort of doing one to wrap it all up together. So yeah, the common setbacks we're still seeing are around you know, construction contracts and how those payment claims are put together. Um, Marianne? Um, and then there's the substantive um, problems that we start to see in the in the claims that need to be sort of looked at at adjudication. So the big ones we're looking at here, Claim works are not performed, um, haven't been performed at all, or the extent claimed, um, where you're overly ambitious um, with what you're claiming in a claim, that's never helpful. Um, the claim value doesn't reflect what's actually been agreed under the contract. There's defects in the works, and then you've got those contractual issues like the um, payment um, isn't due under the contract, condition, preconditions aren't satisfied, how the works were claimed, whether they're a valid variation, whether they're a latent condition, whether there's an entitlement to delay costs um, or whether you're just claiming general damages for delay. Time bars are huge. Um, so particularly under the complex um, construction contracts. So we've got, um, we're advising a lot of people on some pretty pretty interesting and um, complex infrastructure projects at the moment. Some of those pay, um, some of those regimes around cli claiming for additional entitlements, whether it be variation, whether it be for time, whether it be for delay costs, all those kind of things have multiple time bars attached to them. So where people haven't complied with those regimes, those entitlements might fall away. Um, broad rights of set off um, and how retention is you know, properly dealt with uh, are big issues we, we still see when it gets to the point where people are adjudicating. Thanks, Marianne. So I'll, I'll now touch on what your submissions should include. So um, there is no set rule on what to include in your submissions, but we have provided a brief, um, I guess, 
guidance on what we would include in our submissions. So um, under section seven of the act, um, it applies to a construction contract, whether it is written, oral, partly written or and partly oral. So um, if you do have a contract, you should enclose it in your submissions. If you don't have a written contract, you need to break down the engagement. Um, and that probably could be broken down in a witness statement explaining how um, the engagement took place. You need to state the works was done in accordance with the contract and show the nature and extent of the work done. So that's just to um, establish how the construction works are carried out or you're supplying the related goods or services. The purpose of it is to show that the works were done in accordance with the contract and that there's an entitlement to payment. So whether the variation was issues or works were completed um, in accordance with the construction program. In terms of the nature of the extent um, the more evidence you have, the better. So, you know, whether that's delivery dockets, photograph or site inspection reports, just to show that the works have been completed or supplied. You need to clearly set out how the amount, uh, the amount claimed is calculated. So whether that's in a schedule of rates or free milestone payments, um, if there are contractual provisions on that, refer to that. Um, provide logical reasons of why you're entitled to receive the amount claim as a progress claim. So a common example that we do see is um, variations. So the example could be that a superintendent has issued instructions to undertake additional works um, under the contracts. Um, there could be an email or a written variation order in which you signed, you've agreed to undertake those further works. The works have been completed and there's entitlement under the contract for you to be paid. So that's, you'd, you'd also have to provide logical reasons of why. So that, that's a clear example where there would be an entitlement to payment. I, I think it's really, I think like Marianne said, it is really important to look at that. We still, um, we've still seen adjudication applications put in where the person hasn't even said that they've done the works. You know, the, an adjudicator, when they're looking at an adjudication, irrespective of the merits of the adjudication response, still has to satisfy themselves that the construction work or related goods and services were um, done, supplied. Um, and in the absence of showing some evidence for that, an adjudicator may simply just say, look, I appreciate you've put in a claim, but I just can't see that you've done that work or supply or done that supply. Um, and that's where those primary documents in particular that Marianne has referenced become so much more critical. Um, you know, having those photographs, having that um, the time lapse material showing that incremental um, change on site or, or the delivery um, just makes makes an easier pathway for trying to get that um, determination. Sorry, Marianne. Um, and, and that also goes towards giving clear legal arguments that supports your claim. Um, and that's usually where we do assist the most in adjudication applications is looking at case authorities um, in establishing a contractual rights payment. Um, so you do, you should refer to and attach any sort of documents that supports your claim. Um, so that's in witness statement. It doesn't necessarily have to be for a director. It could be a project manager. It could be, you know, a site supervisor. Whoever is able to provide the, um, a good recount of why there's time to payment. So test results. Photographs, invoices, quality assurance statements, um, it could be emails, photograph or external reports, um, anything that really sort of shows the entitlement to payment. The, the rules of evidence don't apply in the same way um, as what it would be if we were trotting off to court um, to make these arguments, but you know, well put together, succinctly stated, you know, clear statements, all those kind of things go a long way to making life for, easy for an adjudicator to look at what you've got and um, coming up with a determination as to what, what actually is payable. So this, now we're moving on to lodgement and service. So if you were to lodge your adjudication application, it is for an authorised nominating authority. We use Adjudicate Today. Um, so they would refer the application to an adjudicator. Uh, and the claimant must serve a copy of the application on the respondent. So with Adjudicate today, there is a, a lockbox system, so you upload it online. Um, but an important point to touch up on is to always look at your contract. So your contract could stipulate who actually gets service. Um, we have seen provisions where um, for the for the SOP Act in particular, the superintendent is the person to receive adjudication applications or be the person to respond to in terms of payment schedules. So make sure you check your contract provisions 
um, the any sort of service will also be in parallel with the Corporations Act as well. Um, so it could stipulate that it needs to be served to their registered business. Um, and sometimes the registered business is not actually the entity. It could be the accountant um, or it could be personal service. So just make sure you check your contract provisions to make sure that um, any sort of service or notice requirements are dealt with. So I'm just going to briefly touch up on some case authorities that we have in terms of service and lodgement. So incomplete service is not good service. In this particular case, the applicant hand delivered some of uh, the application in a box. It wasn't until afterwards where the determination was made that the respondent realized that they didn't have a complete set of all the documents um, that was given provided to the adjudicator. In which case this was to the Supreme Court, it ended up held, it, the court held that the termination by the adjudicator was void um, on the basis that the respondent didn't get a complete copy of the application. So the documents issued to the adjudicator and the respondent must be identical. So in this instance, the application was lodged um, and the claimant spoke to the nominating authority, which was adjudicate today. They then provided an additional email, which was site instructions outlining why there was a delay. This application and the emails were provided to the adjudicator, but a copy of that email wasn't provided to the respondent. And in this instance, the respondent um, appealed the decision and it was the court found that there was a failure to comply with natural justice and the determination was void. Um, the main basis for that was had the respondent been aware, he could have objected to the email, but he wasn't provided that opportunity. And the last case authority is service on the respondent must be as soon as possible. So as I said, with uh, Adjudicate Today, we do upload the, um, a digital copy of it, but you'd still have to serve a copy of that to the adjudicator and the respondent, so the nominating author authority. And in this case, there were multiple adjudication applications. It was hand delivered, but it wasn't until the response was provided that the claimant was aware that the application wasn't provided in the correct form. He, they then reserved the applications 12 business days after. The court held in this particular case that even though they've reserved the amount, it didn't cure the actual mistake. And it goes towards the intention of the act for a quick resolution of the dispute. Just as a practical tip, whenever we do get um, application adjudication applications or the response, we once we start, we usually do speak with um, our courier or printer. So we use law, law and order in Sydney. And the, the basis for that pretty much is that if you can make the process as quick, as easy, as simple, you should. Um, so, you know, if there's documents that you know that aren't going to change, like the payment schedule and the payment claim or the contract, you know, your the printing company can print this at the exact same time that you're working on those documents to ensure that you do serve it on the respondent as soon as possible. Um, yeah, I think that goes, it goes a long way. We probably didn't touch on it enough earlier, Mary Ann, but if you know something's moving towards adjudication, um, you need to maximise the time you've got to prepare for this because even, you know, 10 business days from when you receive that payment schedule um, isn't a long window of time. Um, even with a smaller claim, there might be quite a bit of documentation that needs to be put together. Um, for a bigger claim um, a couple of years ago, Mary and I were working on one that was $19 million and the volume of material that needs to get put together to support that level of claim is quite extraordinary. So you need to be working fast. You need to have good methodologies to ensure that you're producing, you're putting all the documents together in a succinct, clear way and that you are keeping um, what you give to the adjudicator um, exactly the same as what you give to the respondent. And look, there are other authorised nominating authorities in addition to Adjudicate Today. Um, part of the reason we use Adjudicate Today is their lockbox system works quite well, but you've got then some, you've got industry bodies, you've got the Resolution Institute. There's a whole, there's a whole host of other ones that you can see on Fair Trade in where I suppose from a practical point of view, they're the ones, that's the one we've found easier, same as, you know, using those um, external providers to help us um, get documents put together means, you know, you, you start to decrease that margin of error, particularly when you're having to work on such tight time frames. Yeah. And I think the key point that you raised um, previously, Mike, is just not to be, not to be too clever on the situation. Like, you know, if, if there's tabs provided to the adjudicator, have pri uh, tabs provided to the respondent, like make it identical. Um, don't think there's any benefit. 
you know, there's no benefit to being cute. I can I put it that way. Like if you're trying to think, oh, I'm going to be clever and and do something um, that um, makes their life slightly more difficult, it, it probably won't make your life easier. Um, so you know, I've had occasions where um, someone's tried to serve um, the adjudication application on a remote office of one of my clients knowing that the person that usually staffs that office was um in Europe on a holiday so by the time we actually worked out it had been served there we only had two of the five business days to respond um I mean we could have raised jurisdictional grounds um around the claim to start with and, and like um Marianne's raised around whether that wasn't actually good service um but you know, it's just bad behaviour. Same as if you give someone something on a CD. I know that's almost gone, but you know, my life includes people trying to serve um, claims on a on a CD, um, not not floppy disk, just CD, um, and um, or on a USB or similar. Like you run the risk of it being corrupted um, or a document on it being corrupted, and then you've got the argument that you can give the same copy to someone. Um, yeah, there is. I know it's you know, it's not it's not. Um, friendly to the environment all the time, but uh, big paper copies that look exactly the same have a lot of merit because you can show that they are exactly the same. Um, and same as get it to the right person, use like Marianne said, get it to the right person under the contract, that superintendent will use the Corpse Act service. Don't, just don't try and be clever and cute because it normally comes back to backfire. Um, and in addition to uh, the cases Marianne's reference, there's been some this year, which, um, you know, they weren't trying to be too clever. They just got it to probably the wrong person and, and the courts held that, that wasn't sufficient service. So get it to the right people in the right form um, at the right time. So this, there's also the opportunity to withdraw an application and this is part of the new amendments that's been made to the SOP Act. So this is under section 17A. So a claimant can withdraw the application any time before an adjudicator is appointed or before the application is determined. So all they would have to do is serve a written notice of the withdrawal to the respondent and either the adjudicator or the nominating authority. However, if an adjudicator has been appointed and the claimant wants to withdraw the application, it would only be effective if the other party sorry, it will be ineffective if the other party objects to the withdrawal and the adjudicators of the opinion that it's in the interest of justice to uphold the objection. Um, under section 26 of the Act, there's also other instances in which you can withdraw your application. So if the adjudicator has not provided acceptance of the application within four business days of the application being made, or if the adjudicator fails to determine within the time allocated under the Act, so you will be entitled to withdraw the application and make a new application within five business days after the entitlement to withdraw. And back to you, Mike. Awesome. Um, so one of, there's a few powerful tools um, that you've got under the security payment legislation. We've talked in previous weeks about um, in particular that power to suspend if people um, don't pay on time or don't put on a payment schedule or don't, um, or, you know, don't pay after there's an adjudication application. But one of the things that, um, I really like um, is the payment withholding request. And if you're, um, so the security payment legislation has definitions of principal, head contractor and um, subcontractor. Um, but let's say you're a subcontractor, um, you've got a really difficult relationship um, with the head contractor. You have a real nervousness that even, even if you go to adjudication, you're not going to be paid by that head contractor. You have the ability um, when you put on an adjudication application to lodge what is called a payment withholding request. And that's a request that you put up that chain. So you would put it with the principal, um, basically saying, hey, we've put on an adjudication application. Can you hold monies um, that are due to the head contractor um, in, this, in this circumstance until such a time as our adjudication application is determined? Um, so we know that there's monies available to pay us, um, you know, so we can get, get paid fast if we're successful in our adjudication application. And that's a pretty, that's a pretty cool and special, um, piece of, um, 
of a special power under the Act that so you can pretty well bypass the person that would otherwise be required to pay you, tell the person that sits above them in the in the contractual chain to withhold monies from that person, um, and then assuming you're successful, potentially get those monies paid directly to you. Um, and there's a requirement under um, under the payment withholding provisions of the Act that um, if there are monies due to, um, in this circumstance, the head contractor, um, there is a requirement for the principal to set those monies aside Side, essentially freezing them um, pending um, pending the below. So if they fail to do so, they could be liable directly to pay that debt. Um, and the money has to be held until the adjudication application is um, withdrawn. Um, the adjudicator fails to deliver a de um, determination. The claimed amount is paid in full. Um, notice of the claim is issued or 20 business days following the adjudication determination being served on the principal contractor. So you've got that opportunity to use that payment withholding request and then um, the contractor's debt act to, to pull that money directly from the um, from the principal or the or the party that's up the line um, to avoid having to have a protracted argument around getting paid even after you've had a successful determination. So just um, planting the seed of the power of that. Um, we see it used on occasion. We, there's probably many more occasions that it could be effectively used, um, but we've certainly seen it um, help people get paid when they otherwise may not have. Thanks, Marianne. <clears throat> now we're just running on to the uh, adjudication response. We're swap, so, swapping hats out, so now we're... So yeah, so in terms of timing, the, the relevant provision is section 20 of the Act. So you would have to provide an adjudication response the later on five business days after receiving a copy of the application or two business days after receiving notice of the adjudicator's acceptance. So um, importantly, under section 22A of the Act, you're only entitled to provide a adjudication response if you've provided, if you've lodged a payment schedule in time. So um, under section 20 of the Act, an adjudicator is not to consider any not to consider any adjudication response unless it's been made before the end of that time. So if you've failed to comply with these time requirements, you will not be entitled to lodge a response. And the adjudicator, adjudicator is not to determine an adjudication application until the end of that period. And that's just to ensure there is any sort of late um, or the final day before they've lodged, they've provided an application, the response, um, and the adjudicator has all the information in front of him. Yeah, and I think just stepping back into that briefly, Marianne, um, across our team, so, you know, across our team, we've, um, for better or worse, probably done hundreds of adjudication applications and adjudication responses. Um, and the amount of times where um, the adjudicator's acceptance has extended that five business days um, to you know, a longer period, I can count on you know one hand. Um, so, and at best that's extended to six business days. So really treat it, you've really got a week, um, which is not a large amount of time if you're responding to an adjudication application to get all your stuff together. Um, and hopefully it's, you know, you've got that payment schedule on that gives you the best starting point to go from. So just in reminding you of that criticality of time. And that means you have to get that adjudication app, um, response submitted within those five business days. If it gets in in day six, like Marianne's pointed out, um, the adjudicator is not even going to look at it. So in terms of the form of the adjudication response, again, there's no sort of clear guidelines on what's provided. We've just provided roughly what, what needs to be included, but section 20 does, sorry, there is no sort of form in terms of adjudication response, but section 20 sets out what needs to be included. So it must be in writing. It must identify the adjudication application to which it relates. It must contain the respondent's submission and critically reasons for withholding payment. Can't go beyond the payment schedule. So under section 20, subsection 2B, you can't include reasons for withholding payment unless they were already included in the payment schedule. And the purpose of that is to ensure that the claimant must be given a fair opportunity to consider all the issues that you've raised and dealt with those issues in their application. So any additional responses cannot they're prohibited and there can't be additional submissions. So the purpose of that, so if any further submissions can be used as a shield and that's to raise any, uh, address any issues raised, but can't be used as a sword to raise new issues. Um, and But you can still include any jurisdictional arguments. 
Mike, did you want to touch up on that point a little bit? Yeah, so I, I know that almost sounds counterintuitive, but um, if there's no jurisdiction, there's no jurisdiction. So some of these didn't start to fall away. So we have seen occasions and we have done on occasion where jurisdictional arguments have been raised um, despite not being in the payment schedule, despite a payment schedule not being issued and put to an adjudicator on the, on the basis that the adjudicator didn't have jurisdiction to start with because... Um, you know, the act didn't apply um, because you know the payment claim was um, there wasn't a valid payment claim, whatever the case might be. Um, yeah, cutting a fine line if you're trying to run those arguments without having raised it in your payment schedule. So just you know, don't just think I'll ignore the, I'll ignore the payment claim and then if I have to, I'll, I'll try and um, put some tricky jurisdictional things around it. But there is occasion that opportunity to run some submissions around jurisdictional arguments if the if if the position is there's no jurisdiction to adjudicate to start with. Um, we've talked about those in previous weeks in a bit more detail. Okay, um, so look, yeah, what what happens um, is what needs to go in there needs to be looked at on a case by case basis. So you know what you're doing is being responsive. Um, it's an adjudication response. You're responding to the claim that is put forward to you. Now, hopefully, you've done a really good payment schedule and you can deal with that. Um, in the best way possible and you've got the information and you're able to put in you know all the evidence and all the information that you need to to um to to run the argument the claim um the claimant shouldn't be paid the full amount that they're seeking um it should so i am saying it should be responsive it shouldn't just be a cookie cutter approach you should respond to each of the issues raised by the claimant it should be with reference back to your payment schedule it should be in response to what the what the claimant has put in their adjudication application um and you need to do that in the context of what the adjudicator is actually looking to do and that is the adjudicator is there to determine the amount of the progress um, payment if any that is to be paid the date on which it is to be paid and the interest um, payable on it and the in considering that you have to put on the hat of the adjudicator and take into account what they can do and that is limited to considering the act considering the construction contract. And that goes back to spelling out really clearly what that contract is, like Miriam was talking about right back in the in the slides around um, what the, um, excuse me, what, what the claimant should be doing preparing their adjudication application. The same goes for any adjudication response. If you have a differing view um, of to what that construction contract is, if you have, um, you know, other documents that suggest that, um, let's say the, um, I'll just give an easy example. Let's say the claimant, for example, says, oh, no, it was just on a handshake. And you say it wasn't on a handshake. It was in accordance with these terms and conditions that were attached um, or signed or, or whatever the case might be. You need to be able to set out what that construction contract was. The adjudicator also has to consider the payment claim um, together with those submissions in support of it that have been properly made by the claimant. And then they're entitled to consider the payment schedule um, and the adjudication response to the extent it's been made on time with that, with that relevant information. And they do have the opportunity to go and inspect, um, inspect the works or ask for further submissions. Um, my experience is I'm yet to see. I have heard of occasions where it has happened where the adjudicators asked to go inspect the site, but um, most adjudicators I'm, I know or you know am friendly with have said we have no interest in turning up to site with two warring parties. So assume that these things will be largely, if not always, determined on the papers and the documents that you're put in before the adjudicator. So it's a written case um, that you're that you're running. Thanks, Marianne. Um, so on occasion, the adjudicator can request further submissions. And we, we're probably seeing this happen in the first half of my career. Um, I didn't see it happen that much. I've seen it happen increasingly so, particularly when there's interest in arguments raised around jurisdiction. Um, so an adjudicator can request further submissions from either party, and give the other, but they have to also give the other party the opportunity to respond. They can set deadlines for those further submissions and comments. They can call a conference of the parties, no legal reps allowed, um, and they can um, have, carry out the inspection. Like I said, those inspections and conferences are like hen's teeth. You just don't really see it because the adjudicators would much prefer to do things on the paper in my experience. Um, the adjudicator's important, the adjudicator's power to determine an adjudication application is not affected if either or both parties fail to make a submission or comment within time or comply with their um, request for a conference. Um, if a party refers to material that it fails to provide in a supporting material, there is no obligation for them to request it. So um, 
I have seen an occasion where someone refers to a construction contract and didn't include it, the adjudicator didn't even bother asking for it and just said, I'm not taking that into account. Um, so really get your, get everything lined up, get, um, keep with the bird analogies, get your ducks sort of all lined up to um, make sure you've got all the information in there in a coherent, digestible and sensible way. Awesome. Um, so an adjudicator is to determine the adjudication application as expeditiously as possible. So we go back to what we spoke about in week one. The purpose of the act, this act is to get payment rolling through the industry fast. So that rolls right through to it's made the um, claimant get stuff on swiftly. It's made the respondent um, put a payment um, schedule on swiftly. And then we've moved through that adjudication submission and um, response really quickly. The same thought process applies to the adjudicator. So they've got to determine it within 10 business days of the respondent lodging an adjudication application, um, adjudication response, um, or if no response lodged, the period in which they're entitled to do so. If the um, respondent is not entitled to a lodge a response within 10 business days of the um, adjudicator's acceptance of the application, um, or within another time that the claimant and respondent may agree, it must be their determination must be in writing, must include the reasons, and um, must be served on both the claimant and the respondent. So, in the if there's an instance where you want to challenge a determination, um, you are entitled to do so. Um, but we have set out the how you can do this and the instances of that. So under section 22, subsection five, the adjudicator can make clerical errors, an accidental slip or omission, um, a material miscalculation, a defect in form. Um, the adjudicator can correct this in their own initiative or through an application from the parties. So um, as long as it's made within jurisdiction. Um, so for example, determination can be binding even though it's may be based on an incorrect interpretation of the relevant construction contracts. This does narrow the available grounds for challenging a determination. So you, you can only challenge a determination if there is a jurisdictional error. And we have touched up on this previously in the case authorities in this webinar. So for the most commonly, it's when there's non-compliance with the crime of the act or a denial of procedural fairness. So for example, not a valid payment claim, not a our payment schedule or this is an issue in terms of service, the court can set aside a determination in whole or in part. Um, but generally, and I guess this is more of a commercial decision for parties to consider, is that generally there's a requirement to pay the disputed amount into court as a condition of obtaining a stay of enforcement action pending a challenge. Um, so, of course, you know, challenging a termination through court is not a cheap process. So that might be a com commercial decision of whether you would want to, if you'd also have to pay the disputed amount as a condition. Yeah, I, I think, and going back to point two that Marianne had up there, adjudicators may get some of that content wrong um, or it may feel like they got it wrong. We've got to put on the cap that this whole process, um, and I like this term, um, I read it a few years ago, I stick with it, the whole process of adjudication is rough justice. Um, you're about getting a determination, an interim determination around who has to pay what um, during the life of a project. And you can argue about the substantive nature of it, the, you know, when you get to the end of it. But the whole point of this is let's get a fast determination, work out who's got to pay what now um, and keep moving with the project. It's, it's meant to be quick. It's meant to be swift. It is by its very nature going to be rough on occasion, even Good, um, good adjudicators, um, and certainly on occasion less than good adjudicators have um, have taken an interpretation of the contract that I don't quite agree with. Um, you know, and I feel like I go off and trot off to the court and raise my fists in the air and say this this is wrong. But at the end of the day, the whole purpose of this is for them to get a quick determination, and we can argue we can argue it all out at the end um, if we need to. The the only reason you're trotting off the court to challenge an adjudication application, like Marianne um, said, is that there is a jurisdictional basis to do so, um, all that denial of procedural fairness. So it's fairly narrow. Um, and, you know, we've had to tell people more than once, look, a um, bit of bad luck. It didn't, it didn't swing in your favour. We don't really see a problem um, with the jurisdictional element and we don't think it's been procedurally unfair. We're just going to have to eat it up and keep moving and we can argue about it in a year's time when the project's wrapped up. That's a wrap up. Awesome. We've shot through that in 40 minutes. Is there any questions rolling off the back of it? Obviously, at the end of um, Soptober, um, we'll share our materials around with everyone. Um, obviously, Mary Ann and I and the rest of our team are available if questions come to mind um, 
at a later stage. You know, you might have a light bulb moment this afternoon and want to ask us something, please feel like you're still entitled to do so. Um, or even if there's material you think that you'd like to see more of around this, um, then please let us know as well and we'll try and put some rough stuff together. Um, I, I do want to just say um, we're seeing a an upswing in the number of people looking to adjudicate um, or needing to respond to adjudication applications. Um, I think it's, um, oh, thanks for the kind words, Carlos. Carlos is a barrister. We brief, um, we brief as well. That's got a lot of experience in this space. Um, but I do, I do really think, be very conscious of what's going on at the moment. Um, be very aware that if you've got a payment scheduled out there you may get an adjudication application and be very prompt in responding to that if you get a payment schedule and you think you want to adjudicate be prepared like there's no point rushing things out the door and getting a, getting an average determination because you weren't organized like at least if you get a bad determination if you've got everything organized you, you can't you, you can blame the universe you don't have to blame yourself so but really it's a window where we're seeing people having to be really proactive and thinking through and being prepared to adjudicate. And I don't know if that's on the back of people are tied after COVID or if there's a lot of projects um, where there's some bad blood, but we I've seen more adjudication applications, um, pay, you know, aggressive payment schedules and the need to respond to um, adjudication. We've seen more of that probably in the last two months than we had for the 18 months previously. Um, I haven't pulled out the latest version of the fair trade in statistics, but I will over the next week or so just to try and back up my proposition. But you know, the lived experience is we're seeing we're seeing it all on the rise. Um, and um, yeah, that's um, that's it. Um, thanks, Marianne. Thanks very much. Um, I think do we have one more slide at the end, which is just saying what we've got on next week, or was that wrap it up? Yeah, we do. <laughs> so next week we've got Matt and Pat. Um, Matt's a special counsel in our team, Pat a senior associate, um, talking about um, what happens um, if you've got a determination and um, how you um, go about enforcement. And that's, you know, if you, if you are successful, you really want to make sure that you can get that money into your bank balance. Okay. Thank you, everyone.